We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Jeff Reifman. Jeff Reifman is a Seattle-based technologist with specialties in strategic consulting, social media development, Facebook, nonprofit community organizing, and freelance writing. And he is one of the co-organizers for Initiative 103, the initiative to end corporate personhood in Seattle. Jeff, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Good morning, everyone. So start out, uh, give us a brief overview. What is Initiative 103? Yeah, well, Initiative 103 um, really addresses uh, the heart of the problems that we have with corporate influence on our government and on our society. Um, it strips the rights of corporations to spend money on elections, so restores fair elections in Seattle. Uh, it bans corporate lobbying except in public forums, so it restores a level playing field in government so that everyone has an equal voice, the people and and companies that, that need the ear of government. Um, it strips corporations of constitutional rights that have been granted by basically judge-made decisions because the word corporation doesn't appear in the Constitution, but over the last 125 years, they've been accumulating these judge-made rights. And um, these are the kind of powers that lawyers often use for corporations to overturn community rule. So what we're doing is we're basically taking these away from them within the city of Seattle. We're also by doing this in Seattle, we're working with other communities in places like Spokane, Bellingham, Portland, Pittsburgh, where there are these emerging movements um, where cities are standing up and saying, hey, we are, we, our communities aren't working well with these corporate rights and we need to restore uh, democracy to our communities. All right. So tell us, how did you get involved in this issue to begin with? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I... Um, had written an article for the Seattle Weekly back in 2004 about Microsoft and what kind of community citizen Microsoft was. And one of the things that I identified was that the company was dodging the state's royalty tax by using a small office in Nevada. And at the time, they were saving between uh, uh, close to about $70 million a year. It had grown from about $40 million a year when they started the process in 1998. And um, it was kind of concerning because the company was out there telling taxpayers that we needed to spend more money on education. And here they were with this accounting practice that was saving them so much money. And then flash forward to um, 2009 when we had these big $2 billion budget deficits. I took a look at the tax dodge and its status and how much had Microsoft saved since 1998. And it turned out that they'd saved uh, about a billion and a quarter dollars which was almost half the deficit, or more than half the deficit at that time. And I found that really confounding. Like, how is it that um, the deficit is, I mean, there's lots of tax dodges on our state laws, but how is it that one company could be um, saving so much money as to account for half of the deficit? So I went out there, I started blogging, I started this blog, MicrosoftTaxDodge.com. I started, um, but I, I actually started writing the legislature. Um, I also was trying to talk to the media about it, but I started writing all the legislators about it. And I thought, oh, well, this is a no-brainer. And I also thought Microsoft would care too because um, they want to be a good corporate citizen. They're always talking about education in our community. And um, basically what happened is um, uh, Democrat Ross Hunter, who is a former Microsoft executive who is chair of the finance committee, um, he led a change to the state's royalty tax. So rather than being a tax on worldwide sales, it's now a tax on just sales to Washington state customers. So I know this is a bit technical, but basically what he did is he redefined the tax. So he, he um, made it so that instead of taxing, uh, you know, 50% uh, of Microsoft's profits that come from licensing, he's now taxing maybe half a percent of their profits. And uh, essentially, the company's really not dodging any tax anymore because they were able to lobby and get Ross Hunter to change the tax for them. And then shortly after that, the governor appointed another Microsoft employee, Susan Del Bene, to run the Te Department of Revenue. I used to work with Susan, and so I know that she doesn't have an extensive background in tax. And um, so we have now, like, uh, you know, the fox guarding the hen house, essentially. And then um, shortly after that, uh, Microsoft announced a $5 million a year scholarship program to pay for technical graduates at the UW, and the governor starts going out parading and praising the company and Boeing for putting in this tiny amount of money, when actually the company is saving um, you know, way more in taxes. And I just thought this was horrible. I, I could see that basically when an activist brings facts to the legislature, which I thought we had a great legislature, a great Democratic Party here, um, that, that at that level, they're not going to make change. 
And so I, that was kind of the final straw for me as, as a person, as a resident here in Seattle. And I realized that change had to come some other way. So over the past six or eight years, I've been working with a group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, also known as CELDIF. Um, and we've done some democracy school trainings of theirs here in Seattle. We've hosted um, their leaders, uh, formerly Richard Grossman, who sadly passed away this year, and Thomas Lindsay, uh, who now r runs the organization. And um, from that work, it really changed my perspective on how to what, what my theory of change was, how change happens, and what are some of the issues um, that are affecting our democracy here. And CELDEF kind of definitely has more of a grassroots uh, strategy as compared to the top-down traditional methods. Yeah, so the, I mean, just to keep this brief, basically CELDIF started in Pennsylvania and these small communities, these townships came to them and said, hey, we have this 10,000 head hog farm that wants to come in and we're afraid of it ruining our community. Or um, this, this company uh, is trying to spread sewage sludge over our fields and they're giving sewage sludge to farmers and it actually killed a couple of kids and uh, we want to stop this practice. Or there's this huge gravel mine that wants to move in across the street from an elementary school. We'd like to stop this practice. So they started working through the federal regulatory system, which was set up basically to protect the environment and to regulate these corporations. And what they found is that they would basically go to court and they would, they would um, maybe win a small victory, but then the corporation would come back. And ultimately, the regulatory system is designed to permit pollution and permit corporate harm in our communities. And so they realized that as long as they worked in the regulatory system, they were being funneled down a path that their energy was being funneled down a path that was structured uh, to permit the activities that they didn't want in their communities. And so um, they actually were working with a lot of rural Republican landowners, um, people who really had a visceral sense of democracy. And they're like, well, we just want to say no. Like, why can't we tell this corporation that we don't want them in our in our town? And um, so the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund started looking at it differently, and they, they started writing ordinances in these townships that said, hey, we're going to ban corporate hog farming, and we're going to ban sewage sludge spreading. And um, it really fundamentally changed uh, their approach to activism. And it really, um, the peak was uh, about two years ago, Pittsburgh, the city council used an ordinance by CELDIF to um, ban fracking. And that's been widely reported, but what hasn't been reported about that is if you go and read the ordinance that Pittsburgh passed, um, one of the key elements of that ordinance is that it strips corporations of personhood rights, it strips corporations of their corporate constitutional powers that have been uh, created by judge, judges and judge-made judge law over the last 125 years, and those clauses are really what is the critical teeth to these ordinances. Um, it basically says the community is deciding that corporate constitutional powers are anti-democratic and that they don't want them in their communities. And they're standing up to federal precedent, uh, established law, settled law, and saying this isn't working, we need to change it, we as residents are changing it. And those same, uh, that same language is in our Seattle Initiative 103. And how has the Pittsburgh ordinance fared since it was passed? Um, as far as I know, no companies have tried to drill. In fact, the companies have given up on drilling in Pittsburgh, which is interesting because there's thousands of drilling contracts that they, they have um, there. And so, um, but what has happened, interestingly, is that the state has, uh, controlled by the, the lobbyists of the, uh, the drilling companies, have passed something called um, Act, or I think it's Measure 13, or... Yeah, it might be Measure 16, I forget which. And basically they're trying to say that it's now illegal for communities to pass laws related to drilling. And so um, you can see there that then our taxpayer dollars uh, are going to fund a legislature that is really controlled by lobbying, um, and the lobbyists are now writing law that is undermining our local democracies. It's really outrageous. I, I mean... And, and this is why lobbying is one of the things that we're stripping the rights um, of corporations to do in Seattle with Initiative 103. All right, so... I want to add one, one more mm -hmm. thing. So um, in New York, another community working with CELDIF passed a fracking ban as well. And recently, the New York, one of the New York state courts upheld that community's right to set uh, 
law restricting corporate activities. And so that's a really huge precedent for this kind of local lawmaking, and we're really excited about that. So let's talk more about specifically what the uh, your initiative would do for Seattle. Maybe break it down into uh, the specific elements that are listed in that law. Sure. Um, so what Initiative 103 does is it's um, basically um, elevating people's rights above corporate rights, and it's stripping corporate rights um, in order to secure people's rights. Um, and so there are um, various clauses that sort of are interrelated and balance each other. So um, the first things that it does, um, well, let's, let's walk through um, some of the rights and some of the restrictions. So it creates a right to fair elections, which means that it's a, we have an electoral process in Seattle that's free from corporate inter interference. And so um, what, that, what the ban that's related to that is that we are directly taking on Citizens United. We are saying that corporate spending on elections is distorting our democracy here in, in Seattle, and we're basically banning electioneering, that corporations will not be allowed to make, be able to make contributions or expenditures on elections in Seattle. Um, and what's different about this than, say, um, you know, the Citizens United decision at the Supreme Court angered a lot of people, but it was really an abstract decision. You had this uh, right-wing interest group that wanted to spend as much money advertising this anti-Hillary Clinton movie. It actually wasn't really about any particular community, and it was amazing how upset people got about it. Um, but what we would have here is um, we're, we're trying to make law that basically says that corporations can't spend money on elections. And we're challenging state and federal uh, precedents to tell us that we can't decide what we want in Seattle. So um, then we're establishing a right to clean government. And what that means is um, that corporations cannot kind of go behind the scenes and make policy with legislature, with, with the city government, lobby the government. Um, and basically, if they want to talk and influence government, they need to do it in a public forum. And so what this may mean is really um, driving transparency across city operations. So one, one thing that comes right to mind is actually this all the talk right now going on about the new NBA arena. I keep seeing articles like Mike McGinn and I think his name's Hansen are like, mm -hmm. they want to Chris build an Hansen. arena. You know, it's like, where did this come from? Like, how long have they been talking about it? It just keeps seeming like there's this whole plan that's been hatched. Now, Initiative 103 would make it so that those initial discussions would be happening in the open. And every discussion that Mike McGinn wants to have with a potential NBA owner is going to happen in public. And we have the right to be a part of that process. We should not be having these half-baked plans dumped on us as the details slowly leak out through the press. Like, for example, what I read uh, on Publicola last week about the city putting in, like, was it $100 million for land for this NBA arena? Come on. This process needs to be more open and transparent. I'm really disappointed with the mayor for even participating and keeping this quiet for a while. So this is one of the reasons that lobbying is a part of this. Um, the next right is really the right to self-government. And this is really just inherent in our country's founding principles and um, in our Constitution. And we're just sort of reasserting those rights because as corporations have built constitutional powers through these judge-made legal decisions, and these legal efforts over the years, um, we feel like our democracy in Seattle and around the country has been eroded. So um, when we look at the, the restrictions, what we're doing is we're, um, we're taking away corporate personhood, um, but we're also taking away corporate constitutional rights. Um, often this has to do with, um, we're taking away preemptive powers where corporations can often use state or federal laws to overturn local community rules. Um, and we're also including language in the ordinance that's basically saying that the residents of Seattle recognize that um, corporate power has grown too large and that there need to be changes over time to state level law and federal law and probably the constitution. So one of the things that runs parallel to our effort is the move to amend effort to amend the constitution. So um, if we go back to like the women's right to vote, um, you know, when the constitution came into being, uh, it, it allowed slavery and it, allowed, and it didn't allow women the right to vote and it took a long time for those rights to be fought for. The women's right to vote, for example, was fought in many different local communities and there were many conflicting laws. And essentially what 103 is, is it's a law that's challenging corporate power. Um, same with Spokane, same with Bellingham, um, Pittsburgh. There's all these flourishes of activity where communities are stepping up and asserting rights over corporate power. 
And um, it wasn't until the 19th Amendment, which actually took 40 or 50 years, till that was ratified at the constitutional level. So the move to amend is a longer term effort that's sort of res resonant and important part of this process. The real difference with 103 is that we are making law in Seattle as soon as we get this passed, whereas move to amend requires the permission of all these state and federal legislators and representatives who are currently bought off by corporate power. And so we're not going to wait and we're not going to ask permission for those rights. We're actually passing an ordinance in Seattle this year. All right. Uh, moving on to item D, the Yeah, so um, let me talk about some of these other rights. We're elevating um, the rights of people um, to really uh, set a baseline for our democracy here in Seattle. So one of the real problems that we've had is um, a police force with a lot of problems. So, so many problems that the, the Federal Department of Justice is now um, ruled that the changes have to come to the city. So one of the things Initiative 103 does, just really simply, it says that citizens have a right to, um, to have oversight over the police. And specifically, the Office of Professional Accountability, Professional Accountability that does investigative work in the, uh, and um, um, uh, sets down policy around administrative issues, um, currently it reports in the chain of command to the police chief. Initiative 103 would make that report to the mayor. And I should say that the mayor's recent report, where he's sort of setting a, a negotiating standpoint with the DOJ, it actually doesn't even do this. So while it has a lot of good recommendations um, that I commend, it does not um, give citizens oversight over the police. So our initiative would do that. Um, it creates a right to internet network neutrality, which um, basically provides for um, the current status quo of the internet where um, everybody's content, like a small podcaster like Mike or a small blogger like me at MicrosoftTaxDodge.com, we all have our bits delivered at the same speed as Microsoft's bits. And um, why is this in this initiative? Well, it's because the internet has become a core um, piece of our democracy locally, nationally, internationally. And so we have to protect it as well. Um, Initiative 103 also includes rights for workers. It guarantees workers constitutional rights in the workplace. Um, it includes rights for neighborhoods so that um, if there are major commercial zoning changes, um, neighborhoods would have approval over those changes. It includes rights for nature, which, for example, CELDIF has worked in Ecuador to provide rights for nature in their constitution. Rights for nature essentially give anyone in the community standing to stand up and protect the environment. So, for example, um, and we'll probably talk more about this, um, the coal train that's coming to Washington, both Bellingham and actually now in Ballard, um, we're going to talk more about this. But uh, essentially, those coal trains, um, these huge 48 million pounds of coal from Montana is going to come through, part of it through Ballard, part of it through Bellingham. Um, and these trains run open, dust just leaks out the whole way of the journey. You get coal all over the ground into the ecosystem. This has been reported by the Seattle Times um, that uh, we have no way to stop that today. There's no laws on the books that allow us to say that we can stop these coal trains. And so rights for nature, actually, it does give us the right to stand up and say that these coal trains, there's no way to mitigate protections to the environment. So we, we need that to be changed so that we can protect the environment. Um, so that's basically the initiative um, and how it works. All right. So um, I could see on uh, several of these, for instance, protections, uh, constitutional rights in the workplace seem right there that, <laughs> that the Chamber of Commerce will line up against you on the other side of this, you know, because that they'll say, uh, that, uh, you know, that's going to be very costly to businesses. Do you have a question there? Well, do you, um, or an are you, example? In, um, well, it's not being a business owner, it just seems that uh, having worked in large corporations, I can, um, attest to that my rights there were very minimal. Yeah. Um, they could read any of, uh, my emails if they, if they chose to, I don't believe they did. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the right to speak my mind in many situations, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, just off the bat, the corporations are spending a lot of money to um, restrict our rights. You know, they have security teams, they have investigative teams, they're reading, they have teams, IT teams that are I mean, monitoring. businesses are probably the least democratic institutions in the country. Yeah, well, I guess it, what I'm saying is that they're actually spending a lot of money right now trying to restrict our rights. So actually, 
not being able to do that is going to allow them to have more money that they can use elsewhere. But the real issue is, um, so, but that's not really the issue. The issue is, um, do we believe that um, we live in a democracy where we have the rights um, granted to us in the Constitution when we walk out of our houses and when we walk into the workplace? Or do we believe that we have to surrender our rights to go into the workplace and earn a living? And I think one of the key, um, some of the key reasons for this is, you know, um, a lot of corporations are, are creating a lot of public harm and they're, they're doing it um, with secret initiatives. Like, for example, um, I have never received any uh, information from Microsoft employees about their tax dodge. I've never received any information. Um, well, actually, I should, I should, I, that's not true, actually. I have received one tip, and the person um, was very concerned about confidentiality, about the issue. They were afraid that they would get fired for speaking out. This is one reason why it's important to um, preserve our constitutional rights when we go to work so that um, the people who work there are free to let the community know about harms that are happening. So in a way, it's it's kind of whistleblower protection. That's one part of it. All right. Um, back on your, your first item about... Uh, and, and one, one mm -hmm. other thing that's parallel to that is one of the constitutional rights that corporations claim is um, the rights uh, to... Um, unlawful to protections from unlawful search and seizure. And so the regulatory systems of our government are often stymied to find out what corporations are doing in our community because they don't have the authority to get the data that they need from corporations. Corporations stand up and say, oh, we can't give that information. It's, it's secret or it's uh, trade secret or uh, it would harm us if we gave it away. And it's just patently ridiculous. Like our regulatory bodies need to have complete purview into what's happening in, our, in companies and in our community. So that's one of the reasons we strip corporate constitutional rights. Um, so it, it begs the question of, I mean, all this sounds great. It sounds utopian to a degree, um, but you've got a lot lined up against it. You've got these corporations and their government uh, entities that will not want to cooperate with this uh, and will just take all this to court, you know, basically... Um, I would imagine that, uh, let's say this this did get passed either on the first iteration or, or future iterations, and um, and then you're looking at the rest of our lifetime of court battles from well, and yeah, I mean that that's one view. In Pittsburgh, none of the drilling companies have filed suit against the city to drill. Um, I think that this initiative would show that Seattle is enlightened. It's leading uh, the country. Um, I, we're not prohibiting business. We're not prohibiting capitalism. I mean, we have a vibrant community here and a vibrant business community and tons of intelligent people. What we're doing is we're basically um, creating transparency in our government. We are elevating the rights of people. I mean, I think that we will be a beacon for um, really a great ex civic example of how a city of the future should operate. And I don't see any reason why that won't be con and continue to be attractive to business. All right. Um, going back for, let's say, uh, uh, again, a specific example on the first item about fair elections. So that would uh, advertising done, let's say, by, you know, PACs, national PACs or whatever, that yeah, would be prohibited? Let's, well, let's look really specifically at the Costco initiative, the liquor privatization initiative, where Costco spent $22 million to basically push this uh, liquor privatization um, out to voters. And I grew up in Los Angeles where we had private liquor stores. So um, personally, I, I don't have a strong opinion about what's better for our community. But um, but Costco would not, you know, but I can certainly make a point that $22 million distorts the democratic process and maybe is um, really legislation driven by um, corporate power rather than something that's really more balanced and given time for the civic discussion. Um, but essentially, um, if 103 is um, passed by the voters, uh, a company like Costco would not be able to spend money on the Seattle media market to influence an election. They could spend it in other cities around Washington, but Seattle is a huge part of the state voting bloc. So instantly, the state initiative process, the ability of these companies to uh, advertise to influence elections at the state level would be limited. Um, another example, I think it's the American Chemistry Council a few years ago put one and a half million dollars to pretty much turn the election on the plastic bag ban. Um, and they're still kind of keeping their fingers in that issue, as I understand it. Um, they would not be able to do that. So um, essentially, we're just a, 
creating a level playing field again so that people's voice is the same as the corporate voice. And um, that, that's what Initiative 103 does. All right. So where are you in the process for the initiative? Yeah, well, we've really just begun the signature gathering process. So Seattle, uh, Seattle law requires that we gather 20,000, six or 700 voters uh, from Seattle um, to sign our petition. It has to be done on paper, um, not over the Internet, for example. Um, and so um, we, we need about 25 to 30,000 signatures. So um, that's the process we've started. We're basically building awareness for 103. Um, we are uh, building a volunteer base of people who want to gather signatures. Um, we've decided not, we're a very grassroots effort. We've decided not to spend money on signature gathering, which is something that Tim Iman does. We just feel that this is a citizen's initiative to restore democracy. We don't want it to be tainted by paid signature gatherers. So we've made a choice that whatever money we bring into the campaign, we're not going to spend it on paid signature gatherers. So um, basically, people can go to our website, i103.org. They can download a petition. Um, they can get their friends and family and colleagues to sign it, and then they can send it in to us. They can also um, volunteer to come out into the streets with us to festivals and events and um, gather um, a broader number of signatures. Um, I'll be out tomorrow at the Ballard Farmer's Market, for example, talking to people, handing out flyers, gathering signatures. Um, so our whole effort right now is focused on that signature gathering effort, and we could use your listeners' help if they would right now go to i103.org, go to the download petitions, print it out. There's a one that you can just get five signatures and send it in, or one that's larger with 10, or one very large with 14. Print out the one you want, get it, fill it out, send it in to us. You can also drop it off at um, uh, the University Temple Method United Methodist Church in the U District. That information's on our website. We need your help. This isn't going to happen if um, you listening right now don't do this. Um, I'm just one person. All right, we have a couple of other organizers. Um, people are interested in this. They're passionate about it. But honestly, um, we're going to fail unless everybody who hears this message that it resonates with actually takes the time to get involved and participate. And so right now that means that you, you Mike, your listeners, they need to get involved. They need to share the website um, with their friends and colleagues. They can join our Facebook page and share it on Facebook. This is purely up to people of Seattle who care about this to actually take action right now and every day in spreading the word and gathering signatures. Because I, I can tell you, I'm not going to be able to, like, carry this on my back myself. I need the help of everyone. We need to do this together. And uh, do you have organizing meetings where people can uh, come and... Yeah, so Monday night we're having an organizing meeting. That We have an event calendar on the website at i103.org. Um, we'll be putting um, more events. There's a meetup page for i103 um, and Envision Seattle. So you can come to any of those and get trained in talking about the initiative, um, using talking points for gathering signatures, or just have questions answered about the initiative and the initiative process. Um, and then Wednesday night, uh, the Sierra Club is actually hosting a meeting to talk about the coal train, which if we have some time, we can talk a little bit more about. And the coal train would basically send 48 million pounds of coal or tons of coal through, um, through Ballard. And um, it would mean round-the-clock trains, coal dust everywhere, um, and Initiative 103, by um, stripping corporate constitutional rights and establishing rights for nature, gives our community the tools we need to stand up and say, no, we do not believe that we should be contributing to global greenhouse emissions. We do not believe that we should have uh, local train traffic to that degree. We do not want diesel pollution in Ballard. We do not want coal pollution in Ballard. And basically, Initiative 103 is the way to stop the coal train. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time this well, morning. Thank you very much for having me on. You bet. Thanks for coming in. We've just been talking with Jeff Reifman. He is co-organizer of Initiative 103, the initiative to end corporate personhood here in Seattle. And you can find out more via their website, i103.org.